Hi, my name is Cameron Knight. Uh, welcome to my YouTube channel or uh, my blog, wherever you're viewing these from. Um, I'm going to be doing some camera overviews over the next few months. Um, I have way too many cameras not to, you know, kind of share them with everybody. And uh, it's just, it's like, there's a lot. And I know a lot about them, so I want to try to give people a kind of an overview of what these different cameras do, what made them special, um, and different things like that. So, um, so welcome to the channel. Uh, welcome to the first video of this uh, series. And uh, we are starting off with one of my favorite cameras, the Pentax Spotmatic. Um, it was produced from, um, it was kind of introduced in 1960 in the Phonokina uh, convention. They still had Phonokinas back then, uh, they still do now. And uh, it started being released to the public in 1964, and it continued until 1976. There were multiple models. Um, there was the original model, there was also a Spotmatic 2 a Spotmatic F, a Spotmatic SP500, and SP1000. I believe this one is the SP500 um, because I believe the SP1000 actually says SP1000 somewhere and because this just says SP I'm assuming it's an SP500. I don't really know. Um, they're all really really similar. The major differences that you're going to see uh, between them are um, is this action right here. This Ashahi is the original company that made them, and then there were, was an importer company called Honeywell um, that imported them as well. And I'm not exactly, I don't know a ton about the differences between the companies. All I know is that Honeywell Spotmatics are normally found in the U.S., and I think that Honeywell was like the importer of them. So uh, let's dive right in to, uh, to the camera itself. Um, as you can see, it's a SLR camera. Um, you know, it's a typical layout, shutter speeds, apertures, focusing, all that action. Um, this camera actually led to um, one of the most popular uh, SLRs of all time, which is the uh, Pentax K1000, which actually I have right here. Um, so here's the K1000. Um, you can see a lot of similarities between the two cameras. Um, you'll notice that the Pentax K1000 has a hot shoe. Pentax doesn't. Um, but there's also a huge difference between them, which I'll get to later, which is the lens mount. Um, but you can see kind of the heritage of the K1000, which you might be familiar with in the, in the Pentax Spotmatic for sure. So, so there you go. And then there's also, um, in this mount, um, there's also, this lens mount, there's also a camera called the Voltlander um, Bessamatic, or no, sorry, Bessaflex, Voltlander Bessaflex TM. Um, which was made in like the early 2000s, I think, which actually uses this lens mount. Um, Voltlander, the name is used by a company called Cosina. Uh, they make Bessa rangefinder cameras and a bunch of stuff, and they basically use the same body, and um, the CEO or the president of the company has decided to put the body with a bunch of different mounts on it so you can use vintage lenses and stuff like that, which is actually pretty cool. So, uh, my general impressions of the camera are, I, I love this camera. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's just fantastic. Uh, the build quality is insane. Uh, the focusing, despite me not, not having my favorite focusing system, um, I still manage to hit with it a lot. There are a ton of lenses to it, uh, again, which we'll get to when we talk about the mount. And uh, it's just a generally a great camera. The, uh, the viewfinder, um, which you can see, Let's see if we can get a good view of it here. You can see the metering system on the side there. So you can check that out. And then there's a, a micro prism uh, patch in the middle. Um, actually, it's like a donut in the middle with like kind of a extra circle kind of thing. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. Um, but it's basically just a micro prism kind of or, or super matte finish um, kind of focusing screen. Uh, the viewfinder is really pretty good. Um, it's an old camera. I mean, it was designed a long time ago. This is before the Nikon F. This was, I mean, this is like old. So, actually, I don't know if it was before the Nikon F, but it's old. Um, this actual camera was, uh, and, I, and I mentioned before, too, that there's no hot shoe. So, it's important to remember that. Um, there is a PC sync down here. So you can do flashes with it, but there's no hot shoe. I believe that there is an adapter you can buy. I've actually never seen one in person, but you can see that there are two notches down the sides. Um, and the notches there, you can actually slide on a little adapter thing that goes over the top here, and you can mount a, a cold shoe kind of flash to it, but um, I've never actually seen one of those in person. 
So, um, the story behind this camera, I was actually given this camera by my, uh, my step-grandpa. Um, his name's Donovan. He worked for Los Alamos Labs in New Mexico for a long time. And I believe that they kind of issued this to him um, to use for, for whatever. And uh, he sent it to me with this uh, Super Takamar lens on it. Um, and I have kind of built it into a kit. Um, when I first started working for newspapers... Um, in around 2005, I wanted to, um, digital had already taken over by then, and I wanted to do a story, um, because I was working with all these old timers, right, you know, these old guys who, you know, they look at me, they're like, you don't even know what it's like to run film, you don't know any of this crap, and, and I did, I knew all of it, so I wanted to kind of prove to them that I knew what I was doing, and I love using film, so I actually shot a, a award-winning photo story with this exact camera, and the kit I built around it. Um, and it's called Leanna's Voice, and you can see it on my website here. But um, So it has a kind of a special place for me. Um, you know, I shot that photo assignment with it. It's kind of a family heirloom, too. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a really, really nice camera. So um, that's kind of the story behind how I got this and what I've used it for. Um, I've also, you know, I've shot it. I shoot with it just occasionally now, um, especially since I have a whole kit built around it. Um, so, yeah, it's just kind of where it came from for me. So um, we'll go over all the buttons and knobs really quick. Um, we'll start on the top plate. You have a uh, normal rewind kind of a knob here. Um, it's the basic style where you lift it up and then you can pull it and it pops open the back. Um, you can see under here, um, it has some different kinds of film. This doesn't affect anything that the camera does. It's just a way to remind you what kind of film you have in the camera. So if we head over here, you can see that there's a shutter speed dial. Again, the outer ring, if you lift it and move it, you can change the ISOs. That's how you change the ISO for the meter. And uh, you see the little black um, symbol over here that marks what shutter speed you're on. So it's pretty nice. Um, you have a normal kind of uh, shutter release here. It takes a normal threaded uh, cable releases if that's what you want to use. It's actually a really, really nice shutter. Um, it doesn't take a lot to fire it. It's not really mushy or anything. It's just a really nice um, shutter. Um, as you saw just then, it's a normal kind of uh, um, lever cocking kind of shutter and film advance. So there's that. And then there's a film counter up here, um, which keeps track of how many frames you've used and not how many frames are left. Uh, so we go down here to the bottom. You have a battery here. Um, I want to talk about the battery for a second. A lot of these older cameras use, uh, originally used mercury batteries, um, which were 1.3 volt. Um, most batteries today are um, 1.5 volt. You can buy zinc air batteries, which are 1.3 volt, and they will work in the cameras, but they have a really short life. And they also, um, you can also buy like adapters from different companies that step down the voltage from a 1.5 battery to a 1.5 three battery. Um, and you can also go to a company called, I think it's called Wien, W-E-I-N, that makes adapters and different battery things for um, the, these, but they're really expensive. Um, for a lot of cameras, it's necessary to buy an adapter, or figure out a way to get the voltage right, or the meter won't work right. Um, with this camera, um, surprisingly, <laughs> has what's called a bridged electronics. And I don't know too much about electronics. I don't exactly know what that means, but I do know what it means what it means for the battery. And you can use 1.5 volt batteries in this camera um, as long as they fit and they work correctly. The extra voltage, I mean, I guess it might damage the camera, but I don't. I've been using this for a long time and it's never damaged it for me. So the thing with it is, is that you just throw a 1.5 volt in here that works, and it just I guess the, the electronic system in the camera just dumps the extra voltage. I've been using 1.5 volts in this and I get good exposures and all that stuff. Um, but regardless, even if you um, can't find a battery that fits or whatever, um, you can just use the camera manually. The, the, shutter, the, uh, the shutter and the apertures and all that stuff, that's all um, mechanically operated so it doesn't need batteries. It's just for the meter. So uh, the, uh, you got a, thread, a normal thread mount, a tripod mount here, and you've also got the film rewind button. You have to push this in before you start rewinding the film. And that's about it for the bottom plate. So if we look around the front here, again, self-timer, kind of a normal pull it down, push it, and it and moves up like a wind-up toy. You have the two um, PC sinks, which I mentioned here. 
Um, I'm not exactly sure why it has two of them, but they're the same thing. They're not two different types of mounts, they're the same thing. So that's kind of weird. Um, but kind of cool if you wanted to like run two flashes on wires or something. And then you have a button right here called SW. I have no freaking clue what SW stands for, but what I do know is that this, but this switch turns the metering system on. Um, and the metering system is called a stop-down metering system, um, which I'll talk about later in the video. Um, but this actually, like, if you're pointing this camera around and everything, this meter is not on. But if you push this button up, it kind of stays up and my meter's on now. And then if I take a picture, it puts it back down. So I'll talk about the stop-down metering system later on, but that's to turn the meter on. That's what that button's for. So now we'll move on to um, the mount. Um, this is kind of cool to talk about. Um, this type of mount is called Pentax screw mount, or the more common name for it is M42. Um, you might have heard of M39, that's the Leica thread mount um, type of lenses. This is an M42. So not only, um, there were a lot of cameras mounted in M42 um, from all different kinds of companies. Um, the most, kind of the second most popular is probably, probably Practica. Um, I'm not exactly sure where they're from, probably Germany or something. Um, but the lenses for Practica don't work too well with these cameras and vice versa. So um, they're not super interchangeable, but most M42 lenses work well with Pentax. Um, so as I said, it's a screw mount lens. So what that means is you just unscrew it and it comes off. You can see the threads here. You can see the threads here. Um, you can see that this is a, the only like interface between the lens and the, um, and the camera is this right here, which is the stop down. It's for the metering system and to know, you know, the aperture and all that stuff, which is kind of cool. So that's the only interface and it's a screw. Um, you can buy lenses. These are Tacomer lenses. There's a normal, uh, Tacomer lenses and then there's these super Tacomers and actually I think there's super Tacomers and then there's super multi-coated Tacomers or something like that. So SMC and then just super. Um, this is a 51.4. It's kind of cool. Um, I have a bunch of different lenses for this or not a bunch, but a few different lenses for this. Um, but the M42 mount is super common. You can actually buy Zeiss lenses that use the mount. There's just all kinds of different great lenses that you can use for this. Voltlander makes some. There's just, I mean, there's some amazing glass you can get for this. Now I want to talk about my lenses and my kit. So you can see I have the 50 here, which is kind of cool. Um, it's a great lens. It's a 1.4. It's sharp. It's uh, the only thing that I've noticed with it is that there's some color fringing um, when you shoot color film with it. I mostly shoot black and white film with it, so I don't really care. But um, the color fringing can be kind of dramatic, um, which is cool if you want it to be like a you know if you're looking for a kind of vintage effect. The other lens I have. Well, this isn't actually a lens. This is a uh, 2x converter for my 50 so I can turn it into a 100. This is an aperture converter kind of. Uh, but basically you can see here that this uh, red arrow here tells you what your uh, app, you set this to what your aperture that you're using is. So you say I'm using 5.6 and then it converts it down here in this little window. Um, it's basically two stops. So it says f11 in the, in the window here. So f8 at f4 f2.8 turns it into 5.6. So you basically lose two stops with this converter. Um, the reason I decided to go with the converter instead of just buying a, a telephoto lens was that I just was cheap at the time, didn't have a lot of money. So, and I said, hey, uh, that's a 1.4 lens and uh, turns it into a 100.28 lens. So I'll take that, that's pretty sweet, right? So 1028, and um, it doesn't seem to affect the quality of the image a lot. Like it doesn't introduce a lot of uh, distortion or anything like that, so um, kind of cool. So again, thread mount kind of body cap here. And uh, there you go, that's what that looks like. And you can see that these pins kind of shake through. Let me find that pin really quick. See, there's the pin right there. That's what contacts the uh, plate I showed you in the camera. You've got that plate in the bottom here. And that pin contacts that. Um, you can see here too that the pin on the lenses is spring loaded, um, but the pin in the converters is just loose because the springs in the lens kind of keep it doing what it's supposed to do. Um, so there's that. That's my uh, normal and telephoto mode. And then my favorite wide angle lens is a 24 millimeter. And I found this super wacky Sigma 24 millimeter lens for this camera. So you unscrew it here. Um, I don't know why this is like a deep cap or whatever, but kind of cool. 
I've got a lens cap. It's just a slip-on lens cap. And here we go. This is a 2428 made by Sigma. And you can see the crazy thing is this. So it's a Sigma XQ lens, I guess. And then it says Filtermatic Multicoated. Multicoated is just the lens treatment that they give it. Um, it's not a big deal. Most lenses have multicoating these days. Um, but you can see that I have my apertures here, my focusing here. It's a uh, sticky at infinity a lot of times. It's just an old lens, so it gets it gets a little sticky sometimes. So you have that there. That's the focusing. And then up here, you have this other thing. There's uh, these these different numbers up here, and what these are are filters. So there's like I think three or four different filters that go onto this lens. So you have this. Uh, that's the blue filter. Blue. That's the orange filter. Orange. This is the yellow filter. Yellow. And then you have a skylight filter or whatever, which is basically clear, like a haze filter. Um, just really kind of a cool system. If you're shooting black and white and you know how to use filters and you like using filters with your black and white, um, you can't really get a more handy kind of lens than this. It's just super funky and weird, and I've really never seen any lenses that have this kind of functionality on them. Um, it looks cool. It's kind of chunky in the front, but it's not super deep, so it looks really cool on the camera. And uh, the only thing I've noticed with this lens that I, have, I haven't verified exactly, but it seems to not get all the way to infinity. Um, with an SLR camera, that means if I'm trying to shoot something at infinity, I'm going to not be able to focus on it. But every other range inside of infinity is fine. It's just going to not match up with the dial exactly. Um, I haven't confirmed this, but I noticed this um, when I was shooting my photo story with this camera and shooting it like every day. I never noticed that, but when I looked at it a few days ago, um, I just kind of saw that it that it didn't seem to focus at infinity. So I'm going to have to check that out and look into that further. Um, the way to get it to focus at infinity it's, it means that it's too far away from the lens, so there might not be any way to get it to focus, or I might have to like um, file this down. I don't really know what I'll have to do. Um, it might just be something that I'm going to have to live with or buy a different 24 for it for doing landscapes and stuff like that. Um, but the filtermatic thing, just I mean, this is just an example of the wacky, weird, and the variety of lenses that you can get for the camera. It's just super super cool lens. Um, so that's the lenses. That's my kit for the camera that I shot my story with and shot some other stuff with. So now, oh, I want to mention one more thing. You can see that this Tacomer lens kind of has a yellow tinge to it. Kind of see that? And a lot of lenses have weird colors to them. If you look at this one, it has, you see some blues in there and different colors. That's the coatings. Um, the Tacomer lenses, I think, have a very primitive coating on them. And the type of material that's in the lens, I don't exactly know what kind it is or whatever, but what I do know is that some of these lenses can get really yellow, and it can actually affect the picture. But the cool thing is that you can just go set them without the lens caps on, just outside for, for like an hour or two, and the direct sunlight, for whatever reason, makes it so it's clearer. <laughs> it's really crazy. Um, I've read about this a bunch of different times. Um, just whatever kind of coating this is, just is affected by sunlight and makes it it makes it clearer so that's it's just really kind of an interesting little thing so if you see these lenses and they're super yellow i think this is pretty much normal how they're supposed to be um, but if it's just like dark yellow then you can go set it out in the sun for a few hours and it'll supposed to it's supposed to clear it up so kind of cool so now um i want to talk about the stop down metering system which is kind of hard to explain so let me get some of this stuff cleaned up really quick and i'll move on so Here's all the, all my lenses here, get them moved off here, and we're going to talk about the stop-down metering system. So um, to mount the lenses, um, you just kind of have to, you don't have to line them up too well. There's only one thread, so it's not like you can screw them on wrong. So you just keep twisting it until it starts, and then you're good to go. So, so now we're going to talk about the stop-down metering system. So we're, we're going to cock the camera, get it ready for action, and then we're going to meter as if it's the first shot in the situation that we have. So we are going to uh, pop this up, and now what this does is it not only activates the meter, but it also activates the aperture in the lens. So if you see here, it gets darker 
and lighter. And the TTL metering system in there needs to have this different, uh, these different apertures shown so that I can decide what the correct exposure is. You can see here that I'm overexposed quite a bit. Ooh, this is hard to hold in a, in a good position here. And then the needle moves. And then there you go. So I'm, I'm at a you know, six, uh, 30th of a second at F, F4 or something like that, uh, which is just about right for in here. And then when I take the picture, uh, it opens back up and gets brighter. Did you see that? So F4, dark, brighter. Um, so what that is is that it's releasing the aperture. Now, every time I take the shot, it stops down the aperture, but I'm not being able to meter. So, so here's the thing. When you focus, you want it. You want to be on open aperture. Um, it's just way easier to focus when it start. When the viewfinder starts getting dark and stuff like that, like you just don't want to try to focus. It's just too hard. And it's actually kind of like a depth of field preview. So if you're stopped way down, you're not going to get accurate focusing because you're you're getting a depth of field kind of thing, um, like a preview. So you don't want to. You you just want to focus with the aperture open. Then what you want to do is stop down or stop down and turn the meter on get your adjustment right, and then, you know, take your shot. And then every subsequent shot, you're already, you're, you're already set. You know what your exposure is supposed to be, and every shot, the camera does stop down the aperture. So does that make sense for everybody? I don't know if I'm explaining it very well, but it's a stop-down metering system. To meter, you just do it once. Now, if you're going in between a bunch of different lighting scenarios and stuff, it's going to be really hard um, to have to screw with this every time. But... In most of the situations I experienced when I was shoot, when I've been shooting with it, you walk in, the lighting is going to be the same for at least 10 or 15 minutes. You meter once, and then you just shoot. And then when you change situations, move to a different room, go outside, you meter again and try and and you know to go from there. You just go one at a time. So um, so that's kind of how the metering system works. It's really really weird. Um, this uh, switch on the side of the lens here is the, uh, it says auto, and then it says manual. This is for the open ap aperture metering. There. Um, the manual means that you're, you know, you're opening it up to focus and then you're just shutting it down. And then the uh, auto means that it's gonna do it automatically. Like I said, like every time you, you do it, it's gonna, it's gonna go close the aperture down and, and all that, so. And then open it back up when you're done. So, you know. It closes it down, then it opens it back up to 1.4 so I can focus again. Closes it down to f4, opens it back up every time for the shot. So I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain. Um, but you can do a little bit more research on stop-down metering systems in, uh, you know, in your own research or whatever like that. The thing about it is, uh, the, the funny thing about it is, is that um, the new camera that I talked about, that Voltlander TM, which is extremely hard to find, um, they don't make it anymore, but they made it for about a year. Um, that camera has stopped down metering too, because these lenses are set up for that. They're not set up for um, open aperture metering, which the K1000 has and every other modern SLR has, really. So it's kind of kind of interesting. So now I'm just going to give you a run through of the uh, of the of how we would how we would take a picture with this. Um, so we're going to open this up. Boom and then you have the back open. You're gonna run your film across, it's just a normal, you slip the leader in here and pull it across here and give it a wind or two to make sure that it's you know working right. And then you close it up. Um, what I do with all my film cameras is then I, sh I close this down and I wind this until it's tight. Um, that means that there's not any slack in the, in the canister or anything like that. And then when I advance it again, this will turn and I'll know that my film is advancing correctly. Um, so you advance it to zero, and uh, then you're good to go. So what we do is we would cock it, turn the medium system on, uh, get our shutter speed and our aperture how we want it, and then you can actually turn the metering system off at that point if you want to, just by pushing this down. Um, focus, take the picture, Take the picture, take the picture, uh, and then you want to change situations for lighting. You meter again. Um, you know, maybe it's 
outside now. And then focus, fire it off. Um, I don't know if you're actually hearing the shutter. I moved it just closer to my mic there for a second. It's uh, it's relatively quiet. Um, I don't know if it's just my sample or if it's um, just a Spotmatic thing, um, but you can listen to it. It has kind of a, a bounce at the end or a spring sound at the end. Um, it might be something wrong is wrong with my camera, but not wrong enough to make it hard to use or whatever, but um, I don't know. It's just kind of a weird sounding shutter, but it's relatively quiet, so. Um, I'm super happy with the camera. Um, if you get a chance to pick one of these up, the lenses for them are really, really cheap. Um, these tacomers are just, and the, and the SMC, the super multi-coated tacomers, are even better than these. Um, but these are really sharp lenses and really nice, um, made to really exacting standards. Um, the camera itself, um, I'm guessing this is stainless steel or chromed or something, uh, metal, but it's really, really, really nice metal. Um, it's pretty scratch resistant. I mean, you may have seen on the bottom here that I have a few um, surface scratches and stuff here. Um, but on the top, I haven't I haven't really gotten too much of this. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the engraving is done in. If it's you know if it's painted in there, or whatever. But um, mine looks great. All the ones I've seen have, have really nice engraving, um, not worn off or anything. Um, it's just an all around really really wonderful camera. Um, I just cannot complain, and the, the fact that you can get uh, Jenna Carl Zeiss lenses for it just really makes it kind of awesome. Um, those are really, really cool lenses. Um, so yeah, so and there's also um, adapters to use these lenses on other types of cameras. Um, so even if you're uh, if you're a Sony Nex fan or um, a four thirds camera fan and you want to check out some of these lenses, they're really, really nice. Um, and because see how deep this camera is. I mean, that's crazy deep. Um, deep cameras, are, uh, the lenses adapt better to other systems. So you can buy, uh, you know, Sony to M42 adapters or um, whatever kind of four-thirds camera you're using um, to use these lenses, and they are pretty awesome. Pretty awesome, especially the, uh, I love this uh, 1.4 is great, but this funky, funky 24 millimeter, like, they just don't make stuff like this anymore. It's just so cool. So... Um, I'm going to sign off for now. Um, I'll be back probably in a week or maybe two weeks to do another camera review or camera overview, let me say. Um, I have a lot of different cameras, guys, so if uh, you have any suggestions, leave them in the comments. Um, I love, um, I have a lot of 80s point and shoots. I have a lot of 70s kind of fixed lens range finders. I have a few Russian range finders. Um, I've gotten a, some Nikon gear. I've just got so much film crap that you don't even know. So um, if you have any suggestions for cameras, um, if I have it and you suggest it, then I'll review it So, or overview it next week. So I hope you enjoyed it. If you have one of these cameras, um, I hope this maybe gave you some insights on some of the quirks about the battery or the lens or um, whatever. And uh, I'll finish with the uh, little bit of information that I found out online today. Um, I, I want to make these mostly like my knowledge, but I did learn today that this uh, was originally introduced. It's called the Spotmatic because it was supposed to have a spot meter inside, um, a little dot in the viewfinder. So pretend this is your viewfinder, like your your frame here. There's going to be a little dot, and there's going to be some like way to move it around to wherever you want the spot to be. Um, it's a really funky system. Um, but what they ended up doing, they decided it was way too uh, complex to use. And they just decided to go with an average kind of system for the metering. But um, that's where its namesake comes from, the Spotmatic. And at the 1960 Photokina, comp you know, um, you know, whatever big conference, um, that's the system that they had in place for these Spotmatic cameras. So kind of cool. And uh, I've noticed that with mine, this SP probably 500, I don't really know. Um, it's a pretty um, center-weighted system. Um, at least that's what I've noticed. So... Um, so again, if you get a chance to pick up one of these cameras, do it. Um, the Honeywell versions are um, probably more expensive. There's black versions instead of the chrome. Um, there's the SP-1000, which is a newer camera than this. And uh, they're just generally really cool cameras. So um, good luck with uh, your photography moving forward, and uh, I'll see you back here in a few weeks. So talk to you soon. Bye.